I don't know what this fruit is, what, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Costa Rica. Uh, I am Daniel, I am a culinary botanist and um, I'm, I grow fruits. Today we're going to talk about some of the fruits that you can find in Costa Rican markets and a little bit about the native species and also some of the popular fruits here in, in Costa Rica. I guess we have to speak about hopote because it's the season right now and it's the season is just from August to October, November actually we're finishing the season right now and it's it was very popular I'd say like 30 years ago because my parents, my uncles, they remember eating hokote until like they couldn't eat anymore and you could find it I mean you can still find it but it's I think it's becoming less uh, frequent to find it in in the streets and uh, so what they what they tell me before is that even like you were in, in school or anything and you could go out and buy hokotes and come back into school so you could find it anywhere when it, when it was in season but uh, right now it's just like in farmers markets and stuff like other fruits sometimes you can find it in stalls on, on the side of the road so this is from the Anacardiaceae family from the mango family cashew family as well so the spondias has three fruits that are very common in Costa Rica and um, this is one of them the other one is spondias dulcis and spondias mombin which is also in season right now and you can find it like in the jungle um, but this one is spondias purpurea which it's purple because um, the original cultivars turned to be purple not red when they when they ripen this fruit, people here don't eat it this ripe. I mean, you could eat it very ripe, and it's sweet, and it's uh, yeah, it's milky, a little bit astringent, but it has like a pasty sensation to it, which is which is likable. But how I was taught to eat it was with a little bit of salt. Just um, you grab, you grab like a sort of unripe fruit, like half ripe and then that is very firm and then you put it in a little bit of salt and then you just bite into it. Mm. Something about the salt that removes the astringent sensation of it. And it's just like sweet and milky and salty. Actually, you can eat the, the new shoots as well. I, lo I love eating the new shoots, like walking around the farm just eating the new shoots. Very citrusy tender and just a nice taste. Uh, the Swandias Dulcis, the Juplon, also has edible shoots, uh, which you can cook with it and make like stir fries and stuff. Really easy to grow, a cutting. People use it as a fence, like live fences here, very popular live fence. Also fast grower, fast producer, like two, three years you can get Hokote to produce. I've never seen actually like a Hokote plantation. It's it's just like people have trees and they harvest from them when it's season and they sell them over there and there's one like wholesaler buying from different people and uh, I don't think it's that big of a market but I do hear the stories from from my father and my and, um, people that lived 20-30 30, 20, 30 years ago like um, it said that Hokote was super popular here. Now when it's avocado season, usually the, um, there's not much sale of eggs. Like the sales of eggs nationwide go down. Why is that? Because poor people, when they have avocados, they use that in the morning instead of egg. So they eat the gallo pinto, which is rice and beans and avocado. So they replace the egg with the avocado. Um, so it was very, very funny that you said that because I've noticed that when there's avocados, usually people don't cook the eggs. But that's like speaking about the very rural areas, right? Because also avocado um, has a distinct season in, in these lowlands. This is not the best variety to speak about avocado in Costa Rica because this is the Haas, right? Um, actually, there's, this is the old Haas because there's new types of Haas now like the lamhas, which is like a more of a pear-shaped and, and big uh, cultivar. 
This one originally was bred, I think, in California. But in Costa Rica, it's a very limited region where you can grow hops, like from 1,300 meters to like 1,900. So it's just in the, in the highlands. Where there's other avocados, because avocado is a species from Central America, and uh, well, also Meso, I would say Mesoamerica. And there's so many varieties in the lowlands, so below the 1300 meter mark, uh, there's many, many varieties. Like there's a, there's a market that they do once a year, it's called the Avocado Market in Orotina, that you go and you see like long avocados and like there's hundreds of varieties. Um, they usually grow in the lowlands and they call them or aguacate criollo, uh, which is like a creole avocado because if people see this, they would never call it an, a criollo, they would never call it a creole. But the other varieties, which are hundreds, people see that one is like, oh, yeah, it's criollo or butter, butter avocado because it's more of a buttery, buttery avocado, not, not, a, not like the Haas, which is uh, has a thicker thicker flesh, but really good, amazing. There's even one varietal that doesn't have any seeds, so it's it's like actually like seeing a curua like that, and it's like small and long and doesn't have a seed inside. Um, it's not as tasty. They're working on it, but um, even the government is working on different new varieties of avocado. I have a species of avocado. Well, it's it's a different species, right? It's a gigantic avocado. Um, it's called Persea. I forget the name. I think it's Hippogiana. Um, but it's a big fruit. Like the seed is this size, just the seed. <laughs> and supposedly, I was doing research on it. There's not much literature on it. But the the, the giant um, the perezosos. What do you call it in English? The sloths. The sloths, the giant sloths, used to eat that. That was the, like their staple, this huge avocado. Um, there's few trees. I found the seed going hiking up to a waterfall once about five years ago. And um, yeah, so it's a very interesting low producer, but um, humongous fruit. And it's kind of dark inside. Not not green like an avocado. Um, yeah, that's the persea, which is yeah. fully native and delicious, right? It's great that we've been speaking about native stuff. Yeah, we could speak about the the super native. It's not a chayote; it's called a takako. Um, but I guess chayote is much more popular. This one is a secum from the cucurbit family. It's called Takako and the, the species is Sekim Takako and it's a very fine vine like you can barely see the vine right it's not like a not like, like this plant which is a vine that is like super like you could see it right this one is uh, very fine and the fruits are super small actually these fruits are a little bit like too ripe because what I think is the best way to eat ta takako is uh, tierno, which is kind of underripe. So it's easier to bite into it. It's not a sweet fruit, it's a savory fruit used in stews or used to make ma uh, mayonnaise. mayonnaise. I mean, there's many ways you can, you can make, make sauces with it and it's super uh, savory, goes well with butter. There is a dish called olla de carne here, which is like uh, stew with lots of vegetables and it's a type of meat called osobuco which has a lot of it's like a bone broth soup and this is usually goes into the into that soup like when it's like this when it's right like you have to cook it for a long time for it to like extract flavors and stuff mm. but you can eat the seed and everything um, but when it's tierno the seed is smaller so you have more flesh um, but it is an endemic species of Costa Rica and um, it's, it's, it's delicious. I love it. This is a Bactris, Bactris gasipes. It's an awesome fruit. My uncle used to say that you could be satiated just by eating two fruits. 
because it's very high in calories and it's very very starchy I mean it's like a very starchy kind of tastes like yeah Richard said it like chickpeas a little bit like tomato it's like has that savory tomato mm. you do have to cook it so this is cooked already um, but it's very easy to find stands on the side of the road just like cooking in like a stove with lots of water and uh, people eat it here with um, with uh, actually you can make like a mayo with this and put it in here people because people usually eat it, eat it with mayo mayo is really good with pehibai this is called by a bacteria that grows on the fruits when it's um, when it's in the palm still so people say that these are more tasty right and I've heard that since I was a child but I think it's not because of the bacteria that grows and it creates this, um, this these grooves it's because it kind of breaks the skin a little bit so when you cook it the, it seeps more flavor into it so I think these usually are tastier because of that I like to cook it in broth like in vegetable broth and then you put the pehibais in to cook in a pressure cooker and you have to go let it go for a few hours because it's rock solid when it's when it's raw. Um, oh, there's another bird over there. Yeah. The inside of the seed is very tasty. So it's just like a, how would I describe it? Like a very ripe coconut that gets um, really oily and tough. Um, the inside of the coconut. So it's just like that. Mmm. Mmm. So it's oily and it has that savory as well. I've never seen anyone use this, but oh, there's a toucan behind you. Like, it's so close. This fruit is called Puruba. It actually grows only in the highlands of Costa Rica. If you try to grow it in the humid tropics, it won't grow. But there's other species from the Passiflora genus that you can grow in, uh, in many parts of the country. So this one um, is Passiflora tripartita and um, it is called the banana passion fruit in English. And uh, it's quite sour, it's good for making juices, quite the tropical taste, like it has that distinct tropical taste and aroma to it. Uh, what I like about this is the flowers actually. The flowers are super long, uh, pink, tubular flowers that only hummingbirds can pollinize. So the flowers have been evolving with uh, certain species of hummingbirds that have a long beak. So it, it has been specialized with this, with this type of hummingbird. So it's an interesting evolutionary story about it. Here in Costa Rica, People it, eat this um, banana passion fruit by adding it to juices or you can even make desserts with it actually and also with a spoon just straight up it's not very popular it has a very distinct season it's not like the granadilla which is very very popular this one is called the giant granadilla or giant passion fruit it's from the same genus as this one, um, mm -hmm. and this one does grow in the in the lowlands. The species is called Passiflora quadrangularis, and that's because the vine, the stem of the vine, is uh, in, a, in a square shape. Uh, so that's how you identify this this plant without actually seeing the fruit or seeing the flower. And it's the biggest flower in the Passiflora genus. Don't call me on that, maybe there's a new species actually now in the Talamanca region that has a bigger flower. But it has a big flower, big fruit. It's like this big. It's, it's so, so cool. Actually, I've heard of people doing teas with the flower as well. So, so it's a calming, calming uh, tea. And you can do it with other species of Passiflora as well. It's very popular in Nicaragua. I've, I've, I've had it more in Nicaragua. But what, what I like about this fruit is that you can eat the mesocarp. So actually, what you eat here 
is is not the mesocarp, but it's the um, it's the flesh that surrounds the seeds. So the mesocarp here is the actual fruit from the rind to the seeds. That's like the best part to eat. It's it's pretty tasty. It's great for juices, and it makes a lot. Like it's you can make three or four liters with one fruit. So actually you just cut the fruit and you just put it in a blender and blend it up and the whole fruit, like everything. Yeah, because the skin is very like, you know, it's just a very like this, oh, wow. you know? Oh, wow. and, and this is full of juice, like this is so juicy here. And you can eat the skin and everything. Which is different from other passion fruits. Uh, this one is very particular in that in that sense. Other passion fruits have like a really uh, thick rind, right? And it's hard to get into. Um, but this one is not. It's not as acidic as other passion fruits. The flavor is more of a... Um, how I get to describe it? It's, I don't know why I relate these to cantaloupe, but it has like that cantaloupe taste. Um, Maybe we could try juice later, and you guys could tell tell us how, how what you think. Mame sapote uh, from the Poteria genus, Poteria sapota. So actually, the Poteria genus has a lot of species in Central America. It grows in the dry tropics mostly, in wet regions. Well, maybe you could grow in the wet regions, but I find that mostly in the in the dry. It, areas of Costa Rica you could find it more. It is from Mesoamerica, like the species grows all around Mesoamerica. It has been growing here for a long time. There's an open one over here. Big seed, orange flesh. I mean, people don't go crazy for it, you know? Mm. It's, it's not like a pineapple, people go crazy for it. Okay. <laughs> but it is easy to find. One fun fact about sapote is that the fruit uh, lasts like 24 months to ripen so it takes a long time for a fruit from flower to picking right wow. and you have to pick it when you scratch it and it's not green anymore it's it's like that and they tend to drop all at once when when like one is starting to get ripe they're all like dropping and suddenly you have like five boxes of sapote The species is Solanum quinotense, so oh, Quitoense, I think. So it's from Quito, Ecuador. Yeah, it's from South America. Uh, in South America, they call it Lulo, and um, I don't know the name in English. Very popular in Colombia. Here is not that popular, um, but it is growing in popularity. You grow it in the colder regions of Costa Rica, and. Um, yeah, it's great for juices or marmalades or making like a type of sauce, adding it to like a, yeah, like a sauce. And um, I don't know much about it, but I enjoy the fruit. And I, in the coffee plantation, I do have some hedge rows of these right next to the coffee because it just grows very well where the coffee is growing. So Rolinia, right? This is a uh, Rolinia deliciosa. It's from the Anonesi family, it's called Biriba uh, or Biriba. It's not that popular here. It has been recently introduced into into all the fruits of Costa Rica. So Biriba is from Brazil, and I think people that brought him here were foreigners, not actually Costa Ricans or no institution brought it here like like the Ibae was brought but it was like mostly foreigners that came and bought land and started planting uh, Biriba and yeah there is a relative from the Biriba that is very popular here and it's widely grown in the Caribbean side and every Costa Rican knows it and it's called Guanabana which is Anona Muricata looks kind of similar because it has the spikes but it's uh, green and bigger but the Biriba I think it's tastier than the guanabana and it has like a really nice flesh. It's, I call it like a yogurt fruit. For me it's like a yogurt fruit, it's like a vegan yogurt, you know? And 
I think they call it like lemon meringue pie fruit because it has like that distinct custardy meringue pie taste to it. It's a, it's a pioneer tree, so I like to plant it in my agroforestry systems because it grows up into the canopy really fast. They can, in a couple of years, you can have a closed canopy of Viriba. And it's a, it's a heavy producer as well. Although I like the fruit when it's not as ripe, when it's like even green. Like I like the fruit green. When you like slice into it and it's kind of starting to get yellow, that's I think when it's the best. It ripens very fast and it bruises super easily, so I don't think it's a fruit that's going to become very popular. But I do see it in farmers markets more. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about Piriba. Oh my god, I really like this fruit, the Praniana, but it's, I mean, it's not from here. It's very rare. Um, but it's a button mangoes theme. I mean, it's so cute, right? Uh, like a little button there. So this is called Garcinia praniana. It's from the same genus as mangosteen, called the button mangosteen. And it has like the tropical, really like nice mangosteen. I mean, it's like kind of a mangosteen with a lemon drop taste to it. And the way I eat it is I take off the button and then I start peeling off the rind because the rind is not that great. And then I just... Mm, I just eat it like that. It does have like a strawberry and kind of raspberry taste to it. Yeah, nice pineapple, huh? <laughs> um, so we have to speak about a little bit about Paul because this is from Paul Zink's farm, which I've been looking after the past few years with him. Now he's working with the with breadfruit, which... So this is grown in Costa Rica. This is grown in Costa Rica. This is grown in actually farm where it's not supposed to grow. <laughs> but because Paul has done such a good job creating amazing soil and like really good microclimate for, for this one. Dorian, is, there's just one tree and it, it was it is 12 years old now and this is the first fruit and it dropped yesterday or two days ago and it is like very very cool that we're starting to see durian in Costa Rica and actually I am very proud to say that I'm part of this change and this revolution of growing more durian in Costa Rica because it's it's an amazing fruit and you guys know it and it has so much potential just people have to get to know it right because usually people the first experiences they have with durian are not amazing but then they start to know the really nice durians and that's what we're trying to do is like grow the really good durians so people can, can get get a hang of it and it could become the next banana you know like a really really popular fruit yeah the first time i tried durian was five years ago and it was rotten it was a rotten durian it even had like fungus growing on it, like it was awful. And I was like, yeah, amazing durian, right? Oh no, like I made a mistake. And then I didn't have durian for like three years. And then I had durian at Peter Kring's farm. And it was just like mind blowing. Like it blew my mind. And I just want to travel to Malaysia and get more, more uh, experiences with durian and then grow more durian here and there, but Experience all that that you guys have experienced here in Costa Rica and make it more available for people because I think also you guys are trying to do that making more available these experiences to, to to people because it's such a good fruit like it's, yeah so you think this is a montong what do you think that I can tell you in a little bit <laughs> okay. you guys can find me on Instagram um, plant Dan is my my tag Thank you for watching this fruit platter here that we have in front of us. <laughs> I think it's time to eat it. Yeah, time to eat. <laughs> Every night in Thailand, if you have a, um, a durian, it's actually like smash it. Smash it? Yeah, because if I've seen people hit it with like a... But so that's for what? It's to get it to ripen quicker. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you just yeah. take it and you smash it, <laughs> and, and people go, no, 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 and they come with a knife to you. Oh my god. Because <laughs> they think you're trying to open it. <laughs> yeah.
second face. It's a weapon, you know, you can <laughs> have them hit it someone in the face. You ready okay. to open? Open. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's fine. It's coming. Okay. Oh, it smells good. Oh, it's really sweet smelling. Oh, nice. So maybe this, this is the best good. bet. You know? I'm going to do this. Yeah. The future, the future of durian is Costa Rica. It's good? It's good. Okay. 